Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live webinar, Drug Development with Nucle Nuclear Receptor Knockout and Humanized Rat Models, presented by Andrew Brown, Product Manager, as well as Kevin Forbes, Manager of In Vivo Research and Development at Horizon Discovery. I am Marin Mayer Gross, also of Horizon Discovery, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is brought to you by LabRoots and sponsored by Horizon Discovery. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you would like at any time during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen and click on the Send button. We'll save several questions for Andrew and Kevin to answer during the Q&A session. Additionally, we have scientists standing by to answer questions as they come in during the presentation. We will answer as many questions as we can. If there are questions that we don't get to, we'll send an email response in the coming days. Additionally, when this presentation is available for on-demand viewing, Questions can still be submitted and will be routed to Andrew or Kevin and the research team for an email response. Also, please notice that you will be viewing the presentation in the slide window. To enlarge the window, click on the two arrow symbol at the top right-hand corner of the slide. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, click on the Support tab found at the top right of the presentation window, or report your problem through the Ask a Question box. Continuing educational credits are offered for attending this webinar. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab at the top right of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. Also, check out the other tabs that contain helpful resources that may answer questions that will come up during this webinar. I would now like to introduce our presenters. Andrew Brown, who will briefly introduce the Horizon product portfolio, and Kevin Forbes, presenting some exciting research. Andrew Brown is a product manager for the In Vivo Group at Horizon Discovery. He is a scientist with over 17 years experience in both an academic and biotechnology set setting. Andrew began his scientific career working as a scientist in a mouse genetics core at Washington University in St. Louis. There he developed a strong background in animal model generation and characterization. After receiving a master's degree in biology from Washington University in St. Louis, Andrew then moved into an industry setting, working as a research scientist for Monsanto Company in a molecular characterization lab, driving key projects through the company pipeline. Fueled by a true passion for human disease research, Andrew returned to research with Sigma Aldrich Company, working as a scientist under Sage Labs, where he became part of Horizon Discovery in 2014. Following a master's in business administration, Andrew moved into his current role with Horizon as the product manager of the in vivo portfolio, being with the group for over seven years. Okay, now to Kevin. Dr. Kevin Forbes is the manager of in vivo research and development of Horizon Discovery. Kevin joined Horizon Discovery in 2014 during the acquisition of Sage Labs. During his time in the in vivo group in St. Louis, Missouri, he worked on developing and implementing gene editing technologies, focusing on CRISPR-Cas9 and zinc finger nucleases for animal model generation. His primary focus has been rat admetox models for drug development, specifically nuclear receptor and P450 gene knockouts, and humanized rat models. Prior to Sage Labs, Kevin
Kevin was the R&D lead for microRNA product development at Sigma Aldrich. Before that, Kevin was a USDA postdoctoral fellow at the University of South Carolina. He received his PhD from the University of Kentucky in plant physiology. Now let's get started. Andrew, I will hand the reins over to you first. All right, thank you, Mary, for that great introduction. Uh, so I'd first like to personally welcome everyone to our exciting presentation on drug metabolism uh, involving two of our 80-plus animal models, uh, including the two models, PXR and CAR. So again, my name is Andrew Brown, product manager uh, with the NVivo Group. Uh, before we get into the wonderful world of drug metabolism, uh, we would like to take this opportunity, this great opportunity, to give you a very brief overview, and I promise to be brief, uh, of the ent entire Horizon portfolio. So obviously today we'll be dis discussing our animal models and how they apply to drug metabolism, um, which sit as a product within the in vivo portfolio. Um, but, however, Horizon has a whole and a very large and extensive offering of both products and services outside of our in vivo offering. Uh, this schematic is a good representation of Horizon's offering as a whole. Uh, at the core of the business is genetic engineering and gene modulation with over 10 years experience with multiple genetic engineering technologies with the latest and greatest being CRISPR. Uh, with that core capability, we are able to build on that core offering uh, and offer numerous solutions to our customers in different scientific areas. Uh, we offer custom cell line engineering services and also catalog cell lines that are already established. Uh, our products and services in bioproduction uh, utilizing chill cells. Our functional genomic screening platform utilizing CRISPR and our recently launched CRISPR-A, A for activation, and CRISPR-I, or I for inhibition, along with CRISPR knockout. Uh, in relation to that platform, we have our diagnostic services and, and products, also our high-throughput screening platform. With the recent acquisition of Dharmacon, uh, we were able to offer a broad range of research reagents for the do-it-yourself customer. Uh, and then last but not least is our in vivo portfolio, uh, which you see at the bottom of that schematic that we'll focus on today. If you break down our in vivo offering, you can break it down into four categories. Uh, with our genetically engineered model, with our Sage Speed Custom, where we utilize the technologies of CRISPR and ZFN uh, to design and generate a custom uh, model for our customers. Also, our genetically engineered models that are already established that we offer as our catalog or off-the-shelf models. Uh, these are predominantly rat models that have already been generated and are ready for use. They, they involve different disease areas such as neuroscience, cardiovascular, and drug metabolism, as we'll talk about today. Uh, our, transport, our transgenic support services, which predominantly make up of breeding, uh, we're able to breed up your animal models, deliver cohorts, and offer downstream services such as cryopreservation and tissue sampling, uh, to name a few. And then finally, our patient-derived xenograft models uh, that we focus in breast cancer and melanoma offerings, that we do both efficacy studies and have tumor cell lines available for purchase in vials. So that's my pitch. Uh, thank you. Thank you for making it through and listening. Uh, so now I'll turn it over to Kevin so we can really dive into uh, drug metabolism. Thank you for the nice introduction, Marin and Andrew. Uh, again, I'm Kevin Forbes, a manager of the in vivo R&D group here at Horizon, High Horizon Discovery. I'd like to share with you today some of the models we've generated and are currently characterizing that can be used in drug development. I'll give you a brief history of our in vivo group and some background into the research area of the talk, specifically knockout and humanized admitox rat models. A 
I'd like to start by giving you a little bit of a history of the Invivo Group here at Horizon Discovery. In 2007, Sigma Aldrich partnered with Sangamo Biosciences, now Sangamo Therapeutics, to license their zinc finger nuclease technology for product development involved in research application. Sigma parlayed that into launching Sigma Aldrich Genetic Engineering Labs, SAGE Labs in 2009 with the purpose of applying ZFNs to animal model creation. In 2013, Sigma sold off the in vivo business to a venture capital group, and in 2014, we were acquired by Horizon Discovery. And as An Andrew had mentioned, our focus is on custom knockout and knock-in model generation in mice, rats, and rabbits. We also offer tumor and PDX services around efficacy studies in the mouse, and we offer off-the-shelf catalog rat models of disease. And finally, not listed here, and Andrew had mentioned, is we also offer transgenic services that revolve around all of these areas. Part of the off-the-shelf offerings include rat knockout lines of xenobiotic sensors like PXR, CAR, AHR, PPAR Alpha, and the subsequent double and triple knockouts listed here. Below, we also offer efflux and up uptake transporter models. And these models are readily available and can be found at the following links or through our company's home webpage. So how do we generate knockout or knock-in models? So regardless of the nucleus technology that you're using, whether it be zinc finger or tau domains, flanking a precise region within the genome, each one fused with the FOC1 enzyme to generate a dimer, or small guide RNAs to direct Cas9 to that same region, the CRISPR-Cas9 system, you're generating a nuclease-induced double-stranded break. <clears throat> there are two pathways utilized for double-stranded break repair, non-homologous in-joining, or homology-directed repair. For non-homologous in-joining, besides correct and precise rejoining, the hope is that you get a correct, incorrect repair that will create a mutation within your target. Examples are gene disruption, direct ligation, deletion, inversion, or a translocation, all targeted mutagenesis. You can also utilize the HDR pathway where you can get repair off of a sister chromatid or with a template donor to incorporate a nucleotide modification or insertion of a larger sequence at a precise location within the genome, inserting the likes of transgenes under constitutive or tissue-specific expression, LOXP sites for conditional knockouts, and or gene tagging or incorporating regulation sequences. So what are xenobiotic sensors? They are classified as nuclear receptors, transcription factors that bind foreign or endogenous ligands, prescription drugs, prescription drugs as a foreign example. Then this binding causes a conformational change in the receptor, and they bind to xenobiotic response elements within promoter regions and regulate the gene expression of phase one enzymes, the P450s, phase two conjugating and metabolism enzymes, and transporters. So in essence, regulating drug disposition genes by chemical activators. In this process of drug introduction, binding, activation, and metabolism is a continual process and can have an impact on how prescription drugs function within the body. In addition, environmental or hereditary factors can have an impact on how these receptors function and the genes that they regulate. And finally, since we are talking about rodent models, there is species differences in terms of ligand binding. The human PXR is an example, has a preference for rifampicin, and the rodent PXR, PSN, PCN. As for CAR, differences in CITCO versus TCPBOP binding, but both have an affinity for phenobarbital binding. 
But regardless of their differences in ligand binding, the regulation of these genes is quite conserved across species. So a number of non-genotoxic chemicals have been shown to produce liver tumors in rodents. A good case study that's continually being looked at within the field is mode of action studies in rodents for phenobarbital treatment. Phenobarbital is best known as an anti-epileptic drug. So wild-type mice develop liver tumors after phenobarbital treatment, but mice that are knocked out for the CAR gene do not. And humanized mice for the CAR gene in the knockout background after phenobarbital treatment also do not develop liver tumors. So this suggests that the liver tumor formation is associated with the induction of mouse antibiotic metabolizing enzymes and its mouse-specific, mouse no human relevance. If you look further into the literature, it also suggests that phenobarbital treatment produces liver tumors more readily in the mouse than in the rat, hence it's necessary to have both mouse and rat models available for rodent liver mode of action studies. Hopefully this gives you some insight into how models like, like this, especially ones focused around the nuclear receptors, are utilized in toxicology studies. So we set out to generate rats knocked out for the PXR and CAR receptors. In both cases, we targeted exon 2 of each gene with zinc finger nucleases. The ZFN target side is the above line sequence, and, the below, and below is the deletion sequence. For PXR, we identified a founder with a 20 base pair deletion, and for CAR, a 10 base pair deletion. Uh, we bred these models to homozygosity and then isolated RNA from extracted livers and generated cDNAs for each gene. All the cDNAs present in the corresponding knockout animal contain the deletion sequence, which would encode for a severely truncated protein lacking the ligand and DNA binding domains of each receptor. And this suggests we would lose receptor function in those corresponding knockout lines when compared to, rat, uh, to wild type rats. Weight change is the first indication that the function of these genes was in fact altered in the knockout animals. We also bred the CAR and PXR knockout lines to generate the double knockout for PXR and CAR. Uh, the plots are listed accordingly from top to bottom, PXR knockout, wild type, double knockout, and then car knockout. From the time frame of 10 to 15 weeks for males and 8 to 15 weeks for female rats, in both genders, disruption of PXR led to weight gain, although in male rats, the increase was not statistically significant. In addition, the male double knockout rats were significantly lighter than wild type, whereas fe female double knockout rats were comparable to wild type counterparts. The overall, the overall trend in rats is that dis the disruption of PXR and CAR had an opposite effect on weight. And this suggests that these nuclear receptors function on regulating basal expression levels of opposing sets of genes contributing to body mass, and their effect canceled each other out in the female rats. So what about further functional analysis? Here's our uh, workflow for our functional characterization of the single knockout lines, and again, the double PXR car knockout line we bred. We start with 10-week-old males, three biological replicates, and treat with corn oil, our vehicle, PCN, a known PXR agonist, or TCPOBOP, a known car agonist. We euthanize the rats after a set amount of time of treatment, collect the same region of the liver, homogenize the tissue in triazole, and then proceed to extract and purify total liver, total liver RNA. Then we generated first-strand cDNAs to be used in cyber arrays or TACMAN qPCR assays, run those reactions on our real-time machine, and generate output data, above here for cyber and below for TACMAN assays. And then finally, 
analyze the data. Our cyber arrays and TACMAN assays are designed to screen for several nuclear receptor genes, P450s, uh, phase two genes, and transporters. Listed above, our cyber array is a collection of 48 genes, so we can duplex it with, within a 96-well format with built-in controls and five, five housekeeping genes that we can calculate our average relative gene expression levels. The TACMAN assays listed below cover other phase two and transporter genes not included in our cyber array and the three housekeeping genes uh, used for relative gene expression calculation. So the hope with the output data is that we observe changes in the, thre the threshold detection, the CT values, of the gene of interest, whether it be from the knockout itself or from chemical treatment when compared back to the de detection level of the housekeeping gene in terms of relative expression levels. So here are a couple examples of the genes we analyzed from the qPCR assays. We found that PXR and CAR regulate endogenous and drug-induced P450 gene expression. Uh, the left cluster of each graph is vehicle-treated animals, the middle cluster PCN-treated, and the right cluster TCPOBOP-treated. All normalized back to wild-type vehicle-treated rats. Uh, the dashed line that you see represents the value of one for wild-type vehicle alone, and we were looking for values greater than two for either up or down regulation of the gene of interest. When we looked at just the vehicle-treated rats for CYP3A1 and CYP2B2, there were elevated levels of each gene in rats that lacked the PXR gene, represented by the red arrows. And for CYP2B2, the levels were reduced tenfold in the car knockout, the blue arrows. So if we look at PCN treated compared to uh, wild type, in 3A1, for example, when we compare wild type PCN to vehicle, the purple arrows, there's an induction of CYP3A1 gene expression. However, when we do the same comparison with PXR knockout, the red arrows, there's no longer an observed abduction, induction of CYP3A1 by PCN. When we look at CYP2B2 for TCPOBOP treatment, again, comparing treated to vehicle, there's an observed induction of CYP2B2 in wild type, the purple arrows, but no induction observed in the car knockouts, the red arrows. Looking even further into the data uh, for CYP3A1 in terms of PCN treatment in the car knockout, we observed activation as with wild type. Since the PXR receptor is still present, and the same goes for CYP2B2 with PXR knockouts, since the CAR gene is present in those animals as well. Here's an example of a couple phase two genes and a transporter gene. UG2B1 follows a similar pattern as observed with CYP2B2 being upregulated in PXR knockouts and downregulated in CAR knockouts at the endogenous level. However, no change in expression level regardless of drug treatment compared to vehicle. For another phase two enzyme, SALT2A2, and a transporter, SLCO1A2, there's no change in endogenous levels. However, there is a loss of PCN induction in rats lacking the PXR gene. Again, comparing wild type treated to vehicle, the red arrows, and PXR knockout treated to vehicle, the purple arrows. So in essence, what we have here is a loss of receptor function in the knockouts. Here's a summary of the data. In the absence of a functional PXR gene, 
these genes are upregulated in the absence of CAR. A minor 3A4 family member, the P450-CYP3A9, is upregulated, and CYP2B2 and UG2B1 are downregulated. As well, the PCN induction of the following genes are tied to PXR gene function and CYP3A9 to CAR function. The only TCPOBOP induction of CYP2B2 is related to the CAR gene function. And all this data is, is, is in good agreement with published data from human primary hepatocytes, knockout cell lines, and knockout mouse models. In addition, just recently another group at Concept Life Sciences, which is formerly CXR Biosciences, they published on the single CAR and PXR knockout lines with data in line with our observations, here with treatments of sodium phenobarbital and PCN. In addition to having in vivo rat lines for PXR, CAR, and the double knockout, we've partnered with in vitro admit labs, IVAL, for the isolation and cryopreservation of hepatocytes from those models. The available hepatocyte lines are listed to the right, including a few transporter lines that we have. Here, if you're not equipped to house rats, these isolated hepatocytes can be used for in vitro screening purposes. As you can see, the hepatocytes come out of cryo very nicely in culture, are viable, and have drug metabolizing enzyme activity. Albeit different from wild type, what you would expect from hepatocytes that are knocked out for these nuclear drug receptors. So we plated and screened those hepatocytes with PCN and TCPOBOP and found that they are functionally equivalent to the in vivo models. Similar loss of gene induction with those corresponding compounds. As an example, here we look at CYP3A1 comparing treated to vehicle treated within each knockout line compared to wild type. And we observed induction of CYP3A1 gene expression from both compounds and the loss of that induction within the corresponding knockout line. We didn't observe induction of 3A1 by TCPOBOP within the in vivo studies, also, also with observed loss of the induction in the CAR knockout lines. This difference observed here between isolated hepatocytes and in vivo may be due to several different metabolism factors, if you will, including delivery and availability of the compound to, to be absorbed, transported to the liver cells for metabolism. Regardless of that difference, the knockout hepatocytes show loss of receptor function in terms of gene regulation of the drug metabolism pathway and are a valuable in vitro alternative to the in vivo models. So those knockout models fit right into the humanized model we have generated, a rat knocked out for the CYP3A family members, PXR, CAR, as we've mentioned, and another receptor, AHR. Then we humanized the rat via back transgenesis, which is random integration of the human gene, for the corresponding human genes. Uh, it is also imperative that these genes express both in the liver and the gut. So with this model, we will have you know, loss of the rat function of these genes and complemented them with their human counterpart. This will allow for a human-specific study within an in vivo animal model. The advantage the rat has over mice for this particular model, it's of larger size. In essence, you can do more frequent blood draws, uh, easier surgical, or pr surgical procedures like cannulations for continued drug delivery, and they're, you know, they're better maze runners, meaning better neurological models of study. So I mentioned we, we made a knockout for the AHR gene. So here's our AHR knockout model. Again, here using ZFNs to target exon 2. And we identified a founder rat with a 760 base pair deletion that spans intron 1 and exon 2. These rats have a loss of AHR gene expression. And when treated with a known AHR agonist, 
TCDD, T, TCDD. Uh, we observed loss of TCDD induction of CYP1A1, CYP1A2, and the transporter ABCC3, which is MRP3, when comparing the knockout to wild type rats. In addition, as seen with other nuclear receptors, PXR and CAR, we observed reduced endogenous gene expression levels of a P450 gene, CYP31A2, the middle graph here, in the AHR knockout. So the other knockout line that we mentioned, uh, it was generating a knockout line for the CYP3A4 family in rats, which consists of two copies of CYP3A1, 3A18, 3A9, and 3A2. We co-microinjected into rat embryos small guide RNAs that target the 3A genes and identified four founders out of 30 live births with deletions at all targets and both alleles. One of those founders contained deletions at all the alleles that are predicted to generate missense mRNAs. We backcrossed that founder to wild type and bred to a homozygous knockout colony. We isolated liver RNA from those knockouts, screened via qPCR, and as seen to the at the bottom left here, the graphs, uh, we were able to determine that we had loss of gene expression for the rat 3A4 gene family when compared to, to wild type on the right of, of each graph. The, so we saw a reduction of, of, e, of expression of each 3A4 family member in the knockout line. So for our humanized lines, the back lines, uh, we wanted to determine where they integrated. So we de to determined uh, by fish and sky analysis where in the, the genome the human genes had integrated and how many integration sites there were. So using fish analysis in the above of panels with metaphase chromosome spreads generated from rat blood cells, either looking at wild type or the, the back humanized lines, we probed with a back gene-specific green-labeled probe and an X chromosome paint probe in red. As you can see in this example, we have one integration site, one green dot, one green dot for a het rat, and two for a home. And in the panel below, this back could be located in a particular chromosomal arm within the rat chromosome 15 using fish and sky analysis. All of our back lines followed this pattern of one detected integration site. And with the help of Julie Komen at the Van Andel Institute was using fish and sky, we were able to determine their genomic location. So here's the rat chromosomal map with the location of the endogenous rat genes we've knocked out in the blue boxes and the red bars representing where within the genome the human genes have integrated. And this aids in breeding of the traits within the humanized model to homozygosity. So for our humanized back lines, we've extracted RNA from livers and small intestine, uh, ran qPCR assays to determine if the human genes were expressed. And as an example here, uh, we did detect the expression of the human genes in those tissues. Currently, we are underway testing human-specific compounds like Citco for CAR, rifampicin for PXR, omeprazole for AHR, and grapefruit extract for CYP3A4 inhibition. And this is what we are testing in the complete humanized model right now with all the human genes and the rat genes knocked out. So in review, uh, PXR and CAR nuclear receptors regulate endogenous and induce drug metabolism and transporter genes. These knockout models are useful for studying metabolism of xenobiotic compounds, hepatotoxicity, and complement existing cell and mouse models. And for the humanized rat, we'll know soon their function in studying the metabolism of xenobiotic compounds and hepatotoxicity. 
So with that, I'd like to recognize the members of the R&D and Ops Group, uh, members of the animal facility who provide animal care and treatments for the animals, our partners at IVAL for hepatocyte isolation, uh, Tom Saunders, who has aided us in terms of back transgenesis, and Julie Komen at the Van, in Van Andel Institute, and Cell Line Genetics for our fish and sky analysis. I thank you for your time and will entertain any questions you may have. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Andrew and Kevin, for the informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. Now, while we are getting ready for the Q&A session, two polling questions will appear on your screen. We really appreciate your answers to these questions so that we can follow up appropriately with you. I would like to remind our audience that you can submit questions um, by typing them into the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. Just type your question into the box and hit send. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. Okay, Kevin and Andrew, um, you're both unmuted and back on the lines, correct? Yes. Yep. All right, all right. Um, the first question in the queue here is, um, how many compounds have you tested for your PXR and CAR knockout lines? I assume that one's for me, <laughs> this is Kevin. Yeah, oh, so far. Yeah, sorry, sorry, Kevin. <laughs> so far, we've just tested internally PCN and TCPO BOP for both models. But that recent publication by Concept Life Sciences added, you know, treatment with sodium sodium phenobarbital to that list as well. So so far, it's been three compounds. All right, uh, excellent. Okay, let's see. Um, the next question I have here. Oh, this one's clear. Dear Dr. Forbes, have you thought of doing RNA-seq on your knockout lines compared to wild type? Wouldn't that give a more complete picture of the gene regulation role of those receptors with or without treatment? Yes, we have, and that's a very good question. That would be extremely valuable data um, in terms of looking at global gene expression. Uh, in addition to xenobiotic function, those, the, you know, the PXR and CAR receptors have been linked to other endogenous metabolism pathways, obesity, you name it. There, there's been a really strong link through those receptors. So the current plan is, is to compare wild type, the individual knockouts in the humanized lines, and, and look at the differences and the complementation by those human genes. So that is in the queue and something that we are looking at doing. Um, excellent. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, and to another question um, for you from one of our viewers. Um, do you have a hypothesis for the difference between the weight of the male and female double knockout rats? So, as we you know, the data suggests that, that these nuclear receptors function on regulating basal expression levels of opposing sets of genes contributing to body mass, and, you know, their effect canceled each other out in, you know, in the, in the female rats. Um, you know, similar observations on gender differences have been made in mice in terms of gene regulation of metabolism genes, and it, it very well could be tied to hormo hormonal changes, since the differences are observed once these animals have reached sexual maturity. Uh, it, it, it also raising, you know, the questions of whether it's sufficient to use only male animals for pharmacolo pharmacological tests as the standard method currently used. Oh, interesting. Um, okay, to the next question coming through. This one looks like it's for Andrew. Um, how readily available are your knockout lines? Sure. So our rat models are maintained uh, as a demand-based model, uh, with that meaning as more orders come in, uh, we scale up breeder pairs to try to uh, reduce waste. Um, as you will see on our website, the models are listed uh, with one of four statuses. Uh, those four statuses are readily available, which generally means we can deliver animals within a two to three week time frame. Uh, secondly is available, which means we can generally 
uh, deliver those within a four to six week time frame. Uh, limited availability, six to ten weeks, and then also cryopreserved. Uh, so preferred age of delivery is also a factor on how uh, available the animals are. Uh, these statuses are constantly changing, uh, so it's best to inquire uh, through our website or through your local sales representative so we can get you an estimated timeline for delivery. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Um, oh, and it looks like the next question is for you as well. Um, of course, how much does it cost <laughs> for each knockout yeah. animal? Yeah, no, great question and the ultimate question. So uh, generally these, these models can uh, range from either $200 up to $500 per animal. Um, and it's really dependent on two factors, uh, the age of the animal that you uh, would like delivered and also the customer type uh, with our academic customers receiving uh, significant discounts on, on the models. Uh, our prices on our website are currently listed as commercial prices uh, for industry uh, customers. So for academic prices, it's best to inquire, which you can also do through the website or your local sales representative. Excellent. Um, all right, it looks like the next question is, is back to Kevin. Um, how long can you culture and treat the cryopreserved hepatocytes? So far, we've cultured and treated them up to seven days. Um, with the adaptation of newer culturing methods coming out almost daily in the field, the hope is that they extend them out to at least 21 days, maybe more. But right now, we've only uh, done the testing up to seven days. Great, great. Thanks, Kevin. OK, the next question I'm seeing here, let's see, yeah, this one is probably for Kevin again. Um, how will you know your humanized lines are truly humanized and not from potential secondary effects from remaining rat genes? The best option we have is by rodent and human-specific compound treatment, you know, of the wild type, knockout lines, and the humanized model. You know, then look at gene expression and metabolite profiles to determine true humanized gene function and not the rat mechanism of, of action. All right, uh, great. Oh, okay, so it looks like we are approaching the end of our time slot, and we can address one last question. Um, this one appears to be for Andrew. Um, how long is the time frame if I want a custom knockout or knock-in rat involved in Admetox? I don't see it in your catalog. Sure, no, that's a great question. If you uh, browse through our catalog and we don't have a specific um, gene knockout or gene knock-in model uh, in the catalog. We'd love to uh, provide that as a custom model through our Sage Speed uh, custom model services. Uh, so the time frame from purchase order to delivery of an F1 breeder pair or breeder pairs at six weeks of age uh, can be as little as five months. Uh, keeping in mind that's delivery of F1 breeder pairs uh, so the founders will actually be generated much sooner. Uh, we generate those typically around two to three months. Uh, the timeline for those can vary based on project complexity, um, depending on if it's a simple knockout or a, a more complex uh, knock-in. So it's best to request a quote, and we'll get you a quote with a detailed uh, statement, uh, statement of work of everything that we would do through the generation process and it also will outline the uh, process and timeline. Uh, again, best way to, to get that is submit through our website, uh, horizondiscovery.com, um, or if you're already familiar with your local sales representative, uh, to work with them directly. Great, great. Um, again, uh, thank you to the audience for all of the wonderful questions, and to Kevin and Andrew for your answers. I see that there are a few more questions remaining um, in the queue, and if your question was not answered, one of our scientists will respond to you via email. If you have further questions that you did not submit during this broadcast, please email them to info at horizondiscovery.com. All right, before we go, we would like to thank LabRoots and Horizon Discovery for underwriting today's educational webcast. 
This webcast can be viewed on demand through November 2018. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available to replay on demand. We encourage you to share the, the email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Um, and, and in a second you'll see an exit poll come up on your screen. Uh, we appreciate your feedback as it will help us plan for future webinars. Uh, we would love for you to join us for our next scheduled webinar on June 27th focusing on tips and tricks for CRISPR-Cas9 cell line engineering. Until next time, goodbye. <laughs>